Thank you, Brenda, for the introduction. So as you mentioned, I'm Lindsay Boyer and the Open Space Manager for Carson City Parks Recreation and Open Space. So you guys just saw a very specific view of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, managing the river um, and the natural resources within our community. Um, I'm gonna take us to a 60,000 foot view and talk about the background and kind of history and overview of the open space program. And um, Greg Bergen, our trails coordinator is going to be speaking about the trails in our community as well. So we're gonna be tag teaming this presentation today. Um, and specifically, we're going to be talking about how open space and trails um, build our community and uh, specifically how they contribute to quality of life in our community, which is very important. So a little bit of background for those who may not be familiar, the Quality of Life Initiative or Question 18 was passed by the Carson City voters in 1996. This was a super grassroots effort. There were people literally going door to door and kind of preaching the, the good word of open space and quality of life in our community. Um, what the actual initiative outlined was an increase in sales tax by one quarter of 1%. So it was a very uh, small increase in sales tax that has had very big impacts in our community. Um, so with this increase in sales tax, it provided a dedicated funding source that we could use um, to acquire and maintain open space, as well as develop and maintain um, our parks and recreation facilities. So the way that this uh, funding source is broken up, 40% uh, of the pot goes to open space specifically, 40% goes to parks capital. So creating new parks within our community. And then 20% of that goes into maintenance. So um, not always the most glorious aspect of what we do, but uh, maintenance is huge. And I should say that the uh, Q18 passed by a very small uh, margin. So I think those grassroots efforts were incredibly um, important in getting this passed. So question 18 um, and the open space program within Carson City is very unique. There's uh, no other county in Nevada that has an open space program like ours. Um, both Douglas County and Washoe County have tried to pass this uh, similar types of initiatives in the past. And unfortunately, they just have not been successful. So um, we are very lucky to, to have this in our community. And just um, I'm so thankful to the residents of Carson City all the way back in the 90s for being forward thinking and passing this initiative. So at the time that the uh, ballot initiative was coming across, we had to think about what does open space even mean? What is the definition? Um, you know, a lot of times people think about open space as sort of just a generic term, you know, it's spaces that are open. Um, but for us, it's a little bit more specific. So um, our definition is undeveloped land having significant natural resources, which are important to the quality of life in our community. So you're gonna hear me say quality of life a lot today. That is sort of the name of the game as far as our program is concerned. So using this quality of life funding, um, Carson City has been able to purchase and preserve almost 7,000 acres of undeveloped natural areas and open space, um, as well as maintaining almost 1,000 acres of um, parks and playgrounds. So that's nearly 8,000 acres within our community. We have more open space and parks um, acreage per capita than most communities our size. So that's something really amazing to, to celebrate. Um, I also want to take an opportunity because all of my staff are sitting over here today at this table. We have four full-time people who are in charge of maintaining 7,000 acres of open space, which is a huge feat, and they're incredibly talented and dedicated to what they do. So what, what, what is open space? What areas do we look at? So when the open space program was being created, there's kind of three main focus points as far as the different lands that we wanted to focus on preserving and protecting. So the biggest one, the one we're gonna be talking about the most today is of course floodplains. So uh, within Carson City, we have uh, purchased and preserved almost the entire floodplain. Um, there are a few little private properties here and there, but um, we've been able to purchase almost the whole thing. And the river makes about 8% of our community. So uh, it is a big resource and 
uh, with the pres preservation of floodplain, you know, we protect um, from flood damage. When we have floods come through, we have all this open space, we have all this floodplain, we can let the river kind of do what it's supposed to do. Um, and we can prevent a lot of damage that we see in neighboring communities where their floodplain has not been protected. So floodplains are huge. Also agricultural lands, um, you know, a lot of people might not be aware since Carson City is um, becoming pretty um, metropolitan, but we do have a history of um, ranching and agriculture in this community and we want to preserve and protect that heritage. So um, Buzzy's Ranch, Silver Saddle Ranch, these um, huge swaths of ranching properties located along the river, those have all been purchased and preserved by Carson City and they will remain uh, in agricultural operations in perpetuity. So we're really proud of that. Um, it gives us a great opportunity to interpret that heritage. So we have some old um, ranching equipment out along the trails and along some of these areas. We've been able to create interpretive panels and teach people about um, that heritage. So we're always looking to kind of celebrate that within our community. And then lastly, view sheds. So um, these are the, you know, the hillsides, the um, places that we can see from the city. Um, there is a ordinance within the city, the, the skyline restriction area that prevents development up a certain, you know, way amongst the a hillside. Um, so these are some of the areas that we focus on preserving as well. We want to keep Carson City looking open and beautiful and um, the aesthetics, you know, we don't want to see development just going all the way up the mountain. So this is another really important um, type of uh, ecosystem that we want to preserve. So with the quality of life initiative, um, I mentioned we preserve land. So we preserve land through a few different mechanisms. One is just straight fee title acquisition. So we just buy it for a price price. Um, we use that using the quality of life funds that I've been talking about. So since 1996, that fund has generated about $55 million, which is pretty incredible. Um, and that's all just from that tiny little increase in sales tax. I'm sure none of us even noticed or cared. Um, but we want to, you know, make those funds go as far as possible. So we also apply for grants and we leverage grant funding as much as possible as well. So in that time, we've gotten about $12 million in grants. And some of those have directly funded um, open space acquisitions. So that's been huge. Um, we also uh, acquire land through generous donations. So there are people in this community who are fans of open space and they want to um, be part of the, the land preservation process. So we've had folks um, as well as business entities, um, you know, donate property to us, which is amazing. So um, we always appreciate that. If anyone's got land out there, they're willing <laughs> to donate. Um, but one huge way that we acquired land was through the Omnibus Public Lands Management Act of 2009. So this was a federal lands bill. Um, basically, the BLM, the Forest Service, Carson City all came together and looked at the different lands that we have and kind of tried to consolidate. So for those of you who might not be aware, uh, Prison Hill, Silver Saddle Ranch, parts of the river, all of those used to be owned by the BLM. Um, but of course, the BLM is not in the business of managing lands at the Wildland, Inter Wildland Urban Interface. They have millions of acres across the state. So it made a lot more sense for those lands to come to a municipality and for us to manage them. So um, that greatly increased the amount of acreage that we were working with. And then lastly, we also preserve land through conservation easements. So for those of you who don't know, this is another great mechanism for land preservation. Um, essentially, the land remains in the ownership of the landowner. They can continue you know, ranching operations and things like that, but they're essentially selling their development rights. And so that's another way to preserve that agricultural heritage, as well as preserve these large swaths of land um, without us necessarily having to purchase them outright or be uh, responsible for maintaining them fully. So here's just a great uh, graphic that shows how our program has grown through time. So our first acquisition, kind of when I consider the start of open space was in 2000. So after the passage of Q18, took us a few years to get our ducks in a row. Um, our first property was the Moffitt open space. Um, for those of you who are aware, it's right off of um, Fairview. That was a donation. Um, and then you can see we kind of steadily through time, we're acquiring lands. 
Um, it was a really kind of heyday for the open space program. They were able to just look at a map and say, you know, what do we want to protect? What do we want to preserve? So that was amazing. And then the um, Omnibus Public Lands Management Act, the Oplama Lands Bill, um, we officially got the keys to that property in 2015. Um, so you can see there was a, a huge increase in our overall acreage at that time as well. Um, and, and since then, we've kind of leveled off as far as acquisitions are concerned. We are definitely transitioning more into the maintenance management mode. Um, but certainly as uh, very important acquisition opportunities arise, we are still equipped to jump on those and we have dedicated funding to jump on those as well. But we are very much trying to now maintain all the acres that we have since acquired. So for this presentation, I kind of wanted to go through uh, a case study of how land pres preservation actually happens um, in real time. Um, this is one of what was one of our most exciting acquisitions. So I kind of wanted to run through and just um, give you a sense of how this works. So um, I'm going to be talking today about the Eagle View open space. Um, some of you guys might know this about as the ham property or the ham acquisition. Um, this is a property that is located up in the Ash Canyon area. Um, there was two parcels. They total about 200 acres um, and they had been for sale by a private property owner for some time. I think folks had looked at the potential for development or, um, you know, adding some homes up there, things like that. Um, there are some restrictions um, associated with development in this area that I'll get into. Um, but for a while, this was just kind of an opportunity that was on our radar. Um, so here you can kind of just see another uh, beautiful picture of the property. This property is super amazing. Like I mentioned, it's in Ash Canyon. So um, it's the land kind of directly adjacent as you're driving up to Hobart Reservoir. Um, there's some really amazing pockets of Jeffrey Pine left over here from the waterfall fire. Cool rock outcrops, um, really amazing views of the city can be seen here. Um, and there's some really unique vegetation uh, on the property as well. And of course it's important for wildlife. So going a little bit into the criteria, you know, why, why was this property important? Why was it on our radar? And why did open space ultimately um, choose to look closer into acquiring this? So one huge reason, something we're always looking at is uh, trail connectivity. So Greg's gonna be telling you guys all about the trails in our community. There were quite a few trails located on this property. Some were um, kind of user built trails through the years. Um, they were, some were used pretty readily, but um, they were technically on private property, so they were not part of our sanctioned trail system. So trail connectivity was huge. Um, watershed protection, that's what we're talking about today. I mean, um, Ash Creek comes down in this area, goes straight into the quill um, treatment plant. That's where a lot of our drinking water comes from. So, um, you know, keeping this area undeveloped and um, open was a way to protect our, our watershed and ultimately our drinking water. Um, I mentioned the skyline restriction area. So this is a restriction that we have within our development codes that doesn't allow properties to be built within a certain part of the hillside. Um, so portions of this property did fall in that zone, portions of it did not. So there would have been some development potential on this property, probably not an entire subdivision, but we could have seen um, you know, a giant mansion located on this property. It would have been very visible from the entire city. Um, and then, you know, I always like to tell wildlife habitat and corridors. This is definitely a mule deer corridor. Um, we see a lot of wildlife up in this area as well. So important from that perspective also. So this was a community led effort, a little bit different than some of our acquisitions that kind of happen um, in a vacuum. So. This opportunity, the, the landowners kind of approached us on a weekend and you know, mentioned that they were interested in entering into negotiations with the city or you know, asked us if we were interested. And it kind of spurned this huge um, community grant writing effort that happened you know, almost overnight. Um, you know, a lot of times our staff are the ones that write the grant. In this situation, it was um, consultants from RCI. It was you know, probably folks sitting in this room. It was everyone who um, thought that this was valuable and wanted to jump on it and had the expertise to put together a grant application because we did apply for land and water conservation funds and ultimately we were awarded. 
Um, the Nevada Land Trust assisted with the acquisition. Um, when we brought this to the Board of Supervisors, almost 100 people came out to show their support for this acquisition. So, um, you know, the community was super on board. Um, and at the time, the late Mayor Bob Crowell um, just highlighted, you know, how important this property was to him and to the community and how gorgeous it was. And he was such a champion of open space. So that was huge. Um, but I think this case study really just shows how much a community can do and how people can be part of, you know, land preservation. So um, I wanted to give you guys a timeline because sometimes acquisitions take, you know, five years, 10 years. This was an incredibly um, escalated timeline. So we went to the Board of Supervisors in February, March of 2018 to ask for the approval to submit the grant application. In May of 2018, the appraisal process was started. That same time, uh, we submitted the Land and Water Conservation Fund application. Um, by September of 2018, the grant was awarded to Carson City, so that was huge. And then by October 2018, we had purchased the property. So this is unheard of in the conservation field, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I've never seen something move this quickly before. Um, and it was because there was just so many people who were on board and supported the project and were helping us push it along. So that was incredible. Um, so here's just a really amazing photo in fall of 2018. Um, you saw that sign at the beginning um, when I first started talking about this case study, the for sale sign. So we had a new sign made and we put it over that for sale sign um, and it's still up there to this day. And it says, you know, sold to the residents of Carson City, um, talks about the land and water conservation funding. Um, but this was a great day. You can see how many community members came out here. Um, you know, the current Mayor Bagwell's there, different Board of Supervisors members, folks who helped write the grant, Nevada Land Trust, really just everyone was so excited to be part of this whole process. Um, and I know I was as well. So here's just a, a closer up image of that photo. And we're so thankful to the Land and Water Conservation Fund for um, funding this project and making this a uh, reality. So kind of moving away from that case study, um, I just wanted to close my component with talking about, you know, what are other ways that open space contributes to quality of life in our community? You know, we talked about all those natural resources. There's the recreation component that Greg's gonna discuss, um, but there's all these other intrinsic benefits as well. So um, open space encourages conservation. So there's three projects um, that I highlighted here. Um, you know, we have environmental education down there in the bottom right, um, teaching kids about riparian areas and the river and uh, working with river wranglers and wrapping cottonwoods to protect them from beaver damage. So that's always a, a really fun program that I think the kids um, really get involved in. Um, this top photo here is out at Horse Creek Ranch, one of the conservation easements that we hold. Um, and the community loves to come out for that and help us remove bull thistle from the meadow. Um, and then we have this uh, great photo of a child planting a native plant um, out at Moffitt, we had a fire at that location. And again, working with river wranglers, um, we brought the kids out and they helped us plant a bunch of native plants. So I just feel like, you know, through our connection with the community, we're really able to, um, you know, encourage the next generation of environmental stewards and just get people really on board with um, conservation. Um, of course, you know, open space protects wildlife. So here's just a smattering of all some of the different critters that we see throughout our open spaces. Um, you know, this uh, this owl here was in one of our barns at Silver Saddle. So you don't think about that as habitat, but we've got a historic ranch and we see owls in there all the time. Um, mule deer on the west side, um, especially in the Eagle View open space property I was just talking about. Uh, we see flickers and all kinds of, uh, you know, migratory birds come through. And then, you know, of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention pollinators. My butterfly costume's in the wash, so sorry I didn't wear it today. Um, but we, we are able to protect this wildlife habitat, which is huge. Um, and then again, you know, we, we, pre we prevent flood damage. So this is a picture from 2017. Um, you can show, see just how much of open space was flooded. You're basically seeing just uh, one giant agricultural property here that's underwater. 
Um, but because we don't have infrastructure there, it's all more or less open floodplain. Um, you know, we didn't have millions of dollars of damage that other communities saw after those floods. Um, and then uh, open space protects ecosystems. So this is just a, a cool smattering of all the different environments that we have within open space. Um, you know, we have our agricultural lands, but then we have these really unique kind of desert ecosystems out the south end of Prison Hill. Um, we have riparian areas and these beautiful cottonwood galleries and these amazing places to go see fall colors. And then a lot of people might not be aware, but we have properties all the way up at the top of um, the mountains on the west side of Carson. Um, so we, we own forest as well. And um, access is kind of challenging, but, you know, we, we and you guys, you know, the residents of Carson City, you know, own all of this. Um, and yeah, lastly, I mean, open space makes for a quality of life. It's the reason people move here. It's the reason people work here. It's the reason why it's such an amazing place to live, work, and play. So here's just a bunch of images that just shows how much fun we have in open space and in Carson City. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce Greg Bergeron, our trails coordinator. He's going to handle the second half of this presentation, and then we'll do questions together. Hey, thanks for the introduction, Lindsay. Um, as she mentioned, I'm Greg Berger, and I'm the trails coordinator for Carson City. And I thank you for inviting me to talk about one of my favorite subjects, which is trails and how they improve our life, our quality of life in Carson City. So let's start with a um, with uh, just a little bit of uh, introduction on our trail system in Carson City. So we have about 50 miles of single track trails in Carson City. And that includes, excuse me, um, our famous uh, Ash to Kings Trail, which was uh, built in 2015. Uh, it, it was just led by, the effort was led by Jeff Potter, who I always considered to be my mentor. He helped me immensely when I started in this job. And uh, he was part of Muscle Park, which is our nonprofit partner. And they, um, they, that was the first trail that, uh, the first big trail that Muscle Park completed for Carson City. And most recently, they have just uh, nearly completed the new Lincoln Bypass Trail, which um, it, it's, uh, it got its name because it bypasses the old Lincoln Highway, which is the, uh, the Kings Canyon Road. And um, so it continues a connection from where Ash to Kings leaves off. It'll, it'll come to, it does come down to, uh, to the Longview Estates and um, awesome views of the uh, Border Meadow um, it's, it's, got, it's got a forested component along with uh, some high desert component. It's an awesome trail, and as soon as uh, things melt up there, uh, you're going to enjoy riding or hiking on that trail. Um, we've got uh, one of my favorite trails, which is the North Loop on Prison Hill. It's open almost year round and um, awesome views of the river and of Eagle Valley. Um, we have a few new, new trails that we'll be finishing up uh, hopefully this year. Capital the Tahoe Trail, which will provide the first single track connection from the capital city to the Lake Tahoe Basin. So hopefully in the next year or so, you'll be able to hike from the capital to the Tahoe Rim Trail. And then from there, you can make a connection to the Pacific Crest Trail. And then from there, you can choose to go north to Canada or south to Mexico. So all the way from your, just from your backyard right here in Carson City. Um, a few other trails that we're working on right now, uh, Muscle Powered is uh, hand building the Odyssey Trail and Prison Hill, which is gonna provide a new and improved connection from the west side of Prison Hill to the North Loop. And it's aptly named because it is an Odyssey. It will be an Odyssey when you when you get to see that trail and the way that it, it winds through the, uh, the rock formations on Prison Hill and has provides outstanding views. Um, we're also gonna be working on um, Desert Peach Trail, which will pro provide a new connection to the North Loop from the north end of Prison Hill. Oh, I, okay, I guess I went backwards by accident. Okay, okay, we also have about 15 miles of um, what I call double track trails or um, multi use pathways in our Prison Hill, or actually our Carson River Prison Hill trail system. And um, these trails provide access to almost 5,000 acres of parks and open space that we have preserved in the, uh, in the Carson River area. And they simultaneously 
help to protect and preserve those areas. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But um, as of 2020, we now have a continuous five mile section of trail along the Carson River from Morgan Mill to the Mexican Dam. And uh, these trails are, they're, I call them accessible trails. They're not paved, but they're accessible to, to persons of all, of all ability levels. And we're, uh, we're working on completing uh, a, a multi-use pathway all around the base of, all the way around the base of Prison Hill. Uh, Sniffled by the Southern Nevada Public Lands Management Act has been a huge part of uh, supporting our funding for this, for these trail systems. And we just recently were awarded a grant to, uh, to complete a new section on the west side of Prison Hill. So we're getting closer to completing that loop around Prison Hill. Um, also, with uh, partial funding from the CWSD, we, in the last couple of years ago, we completed a bridge across the Mexican ditch intake at the dam, which is a significantly important component of getting a, a loop trail around Prison Hill. And we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in a minute as well. Um, but that bridge is, um, is open to hikers, mountain bikers, and, uh, and equestrians. And so, okay, we also have, about 25 miles of paved trails in Carson City, and these trails provide access from a lot of our residential areas to our downtown core. It includes trails like the Thruway Multi-Use Pathway, uh, which has a historical interpretive sign component along, along, the, uh, along that trip. Um, it includes um, the V&T Trail on the west side of town, and um, the new trail along the uh, South Carson Street development, or the new development there. And then, of course, we have an aquatic trail, um, the Carson River Aquatic Trail, almost 14 miles from Mexican Dam down to Dayton, about four and a half miles of flat water and about 9.3 miles of class two and three rapids. And there's, there's probably people in this room here today. I know that there are a number of An uh, Andy Aldex award winners like Bruce Scott, Lin Zong, Juan Guzman, Mark Kimbrough that, that all played a part in, in making this happen. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great asset for our community. Who, show of hands, who here has um, floated a portion or all of the, the, the quiet trail at some point in time? Great, yeah. Who here actually did have a hand in, in, making, this, in making this trail happen at some, okay, Ed, yeah. Yeah, great. <laughs> well, thank you, because it was, that was a very, it was a very uh, foresighted, um, Thing to, 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 to get a water trail for, for Carson City, you know, for us that, that exists in the Great Basin Desert. Um, and I also want to mention that uh, CWSD has grant funding from Rec Trails Program right now, and they're working with our open space division to complete a takeout just above the dam so that in conjunction with the new bridge, we can have a portage around the dam and then hopefully down the road, we can extend the quiet trail into Carson Valley. Okay, so why does Carson City build trails? Carson City had a vision many years ago to recognize that trails build community. Studies confirm that communities with trails are healthier physically, emotionally, and economically. Trails encourage physical health. They promote an active lifestyle, which in turn promotes a healthy community. According to the American Journal of Public Health, there's a direct correlation between the proximity of trails and the amount of weekly exercise. And according to the American Heart Association, for every $1 invested in trails, we save $3 in medical bills. Trails foster uh, emotional, spiritual, and social health. Many studies show that time spent outdoors reduces stress, lowers blood pressure, increases creativity, and can help combat depression and promote healing. Research indicate that, indicates that children with ADD um, perform better and are, are able to better concentrate on tasks such as schoolwork after taking part in physical activities, especially in, in a green outdoor setting. And uh, there's a Japanese word, shinrin yoku, uh, which means being in the presence of trees. And that's becoming an increasingly popular way to lower the heart, your heart rate and um, the blood pressure. Um, and there is, um, when, you're, when you're out in the forest, 
you are breathing in something referred to as phytoncides, and phytoncides are produced by trees to protect themselves from insects and diseases. And we're starting to learn that those phytoncides are also help our immune cells as human beings, and they decrease cortisol levels in our bodies. So when you're out there in the forest, you're just breathing the forest, you're actually helping your body to, to be healthier. Trails promote economic vitality and resiliency. The presence of trails increases property values. If you have a trail that you can access from your front door, your home is worth more than the identical home if it didn't have access to a trail. The National Association of Home Builders in 2008 stated that trails are the most desired community amenity that homeowners seek when buying a home. And in fact, just yesterday, I got an email from an interior designer who is working on a model home for a development in Carson City. And she was asking for information about her trails and she wants maps and she wants to be able to display all this information in their model homes so to help them sell their homes. Uh, trails help influence business relocation decisions. Trails bring dollars into our community like the epic off-road uh, mountain bike race. And it's well known that people who visit with bicycles generally stay longer and spend more money. We, we refer to them as wallets on wheels. Uh, if you look at the, uh, Carson, uh, the Visit Carson City website, um, you will see that trails and our outdoor recreational opportunities play a huge part in how they promote our, our home of Carson City. And some of you may, may be familiar with the 2018 economic analysis by the Department of Commerce that showed that Outdoor recreation contributed to 374 billion um, to our nation's, nation's GDP, which is more than mining, including the extraction of oil and gas. And of course, trails um, play an important part in outdoor recreation. Trails help to protect natural resources. Uh, trails can provide transportation alternatives and reduce the amount of mile, miles driven. On average, uh, the average bike commute burns about 400 calories and saves about seven to eight pounds of carbon. And Carson City is using trails to link neighborhoods to the downtown corridor. Uh, trails can develop an understanding of our natural environment and help us to foster a desire to protect public lands and wildlife habitat. And a well-designed trail system, a sustainably built trail system that takes people where they want to go um, tends to uh, decrease in the creation of social trails. And we're finding that with our trail systems in Carson City and in a number of instances we're finding where we have built quality trails, uh, social trails and, um, and yeah, people just wandering everywhere has, has really disappeared. We've, we've reduced many, many miles of social trails by building quality trails. Um, I also want to mention when we're talking about um, natural resources, the uh, because earlier it was mentioned the, uh, the Bagot video, and we now have um, on our mutt mitt stations, which we have at all of our trailheads, we now have a CWSD sticker on there with a QR code that links to the Bagot video. So. Okay. Trails contribute to a safer community. Um, trails remove pedestrians and bicycles from vehicular traffic, especially uh, school children, like our Safe Routes to School program. Um, it's pretty well documented that trails do not contribute to crime. And in some cases, trails have been shown to lower crime. We found in some locations where we have built trails in Carson City, we, we have actually reduced problems um, that, that existed um, beforehand. So, so trails um, really do add to a safer community. Trails were the first means by which humans uh, traveled across the face of the earth. And I think we still have a deep connection to, um, to trails, probably from that, that longstanding um, use of trails for, for transportation. Um, trails provide a connection to history and to help people understand the enormity of past events. Um, our local trails provide educational opportunities related to Silver Saddle Ranch the Mexican ditch, and it's linked to the, uh, to the mills and mines of the Comstock. The Washoe people, including the Gumbalanga Trail, for which one of our open space properties was recently named, 
um, the history of Eagle Valley and the uh, V&T Railroad. And trails connect people. Trails help us to develop a sense of place. Um, according to the AARP, trails promote respect for diversity and inclusiveness. Um, studies show that trails help to improve social socialization. Psychology Today says that there's an inverse relationship between trails and loneliness. Um, and we are, in Carson City, we are trying to build as many trails as we can that are as accessible to as many people as we can. We want our trails to be inclusive for everybody. And best of all, our trails are free to use, providing low-cost recreational opportunities for everyone. So how do trails get built? Um, it takes a community to build trails. And trails begin with planning. Trails are not just random. They should connect people with places. And planning for trails in Carson City goes back many, many years. Um, 1995, the Eagle Valley Trail System Report. 1996, the Carson River Master Plan included recommendations for trails. Uh, Carson River Master Plan, I'm not sure if I said that right. Um, 2006, our Board of Supervisors uh, approved the first Unified Pathways Master Plan, which ensures that um, it has long range, plan, long range planning for our trails. And most importantly, I always uh, think that it, it, it makes sure that we will never um, lose access to our public lands because when, when a development is proposed, trails have a place at the table. In 2008, the Eagle Valley Trails Committee Oh, I'm sorry, this, we had 2008 was, a, was the Carson River Silver Saddle Ranch Charette, which made recommendations for trails. 2017, the Eagle Valley Trails Committee Community Trail Inventory Review Evaluation and User Assessment was a community-based effort that uh, involved many people over a period of years. And the recommendations from that report then went into an update, a 2018 update of our Unified Pathways Master Plan to help guide us even farther into the future. Um, as Lindsay, Lindsay mentioned, quality of, a, quality of life, Q18 funding helps to fund some of our trails. It also helps to um, uh, leverage funding from, from other grants. Um, we collaborate with state and federal agencies and then volunteers. Uh, without volunteers, we couldn't do what we do. Muscle powered, adopt a trail program, Boy Scouts and many other groups and local service organizations annually contribute over 4,500 hours to parks and trails. And in, 21, in 2021, Muscle Powered alone contributed 3,000 hours to trail planning, building, and maintenance. So I guess final thoughts, trails build community, and it takes a community to build trails. By building trails, Carson City is investing in its future, its citizens, its economy, and its well-being, well -being and its culture. And I just wanted to mention a couple of things on these photos. The, the big photo on top shows volunteers building Bob's Trail. Lindsay uh, mentioned our former mayor, Bob Crow, who was uh, actively, actively promoted trails and uh, open space in our community. And the uh, photo in the lower left is muscle powered working on the Lincoln Bypass Trail. And then in the lower right, that is the Carson High School Navy ROTC building a bridge across the Foothill Trail in 2018. So. And with that, um, I'll take any questions that you may have for Lindsay and I.